there. You're very welcome to this episode of Dark Vanishings. I hope you're having a nice weekend wherever you are in the world. This is a short and sweet one today, but it's a good one. The identity of the summon of man has been revealed after 73 years. It's an incredible piece of detective work, which has been successfully achieved by Professor Derek Abbott, who lectures in electrical engineering at the University of Adelaide, and Colleen Fitzpatrick, who is a forensic genealogist. They both feel that they are 99.99% correct based on their methodologies, and both of them are sort of highly experienced in the research and sort of DNA genealogy area. Uh, of course, the death still has to be confirmed by the coroner, but it is certainly looking as if it is over the line uh, and that the rest is really just a formality. For those of you who aren't familiar with the story, the summit of man was found deceased on a beach in South Australia on the 1st of December in 1948. The tags had been removed from his clothing and he had no wallet on his person. So an identification couldn't be made. That is until some 73 years later and the last couple of days in which we have found out uh, who he really is. In this video, I'd like to uh, update you about the uh, revelations or the announcements of the last few days. Uh, and give you some more details about his identity. And I'd also like to look at what I got right and what I got wrong in my Dark Vanishing video about the Summit of Man. So let's hop into it. There are so many layers of mystery to the Summit of Man case. It, it's extraordinary. In the bottom right hand corner, there is a small piece of paper with the words Tamam should written on it. These words were purged and they meant finish or ended, which could suggest that the summon of man committed suicide. Uh, the piece of paper is taken from his copy of a book called the Rubaiyat of Al-Qayyam. And in that copy of the book, a mysterious code was found. And you can see an extract of it there in the top right hand corner. The number of a woman called, called Jessica Thompson was also found and it was uh, speculated that perhaps she was linked in some way to his death. Finally, on the left, you can see a plaster cast that was taken of the summit of man prior to his death, of his face, upper torso, etc. And this was to help with identification after he died. Some hairs were trapped in this plaster cast. These were removed. DNA was extracted from the hairs. And this DNA has now been linked to living relatives, which is just an incredible leap forward in the case. It was so great this week to wake up to newspaper coverage of the Summit of Man with some actual concrete facts. Uh, after so many years of uncertainty, 73 years to be precise, I can now reveal that the Summit of Man was a man called Carl Webb. He was born in 1905 and prior to his death, he had been living in Melbourne. He was separated from his wife and she had moved to South Australia. Uh, so even in just those few uh, facts, uh, there is just finally so much certainty. And I think a lot more certainty will come going forward uh, as all the facts of the case are now pieced together. So what did my Dark Vanishings video about the Summit of Man get right? And we have to remember it's what I've got right so far at this juncture. Facts uh, will continue to sort of mutate. Uh, as they start to pin things together now that they have his name. But I'd just like to see how uh, the Dark Vanishings video is lining up so far. So what did I get right about the case so far in light of the facts that are emerging? And they may change again uh, as time goes on. But so far, Professor Derek Abbott and Colleen Fitzpatrick believe that the Summon of Man was most likely not a spy. And I did put forward in my Summon of Man video that I thought he was not a spy. I also suggested that Jessica Thompson wasn't a spy either. I know that her daughter has given an interview in which she thought that she might have been a spy, that she spoke Russian, etc. But I think that she spoke, uh, you know, other languages, probably due to the fact that she taught English and she did deal with a lot of Russian immigrants. Uh, and I think there's nothing more to it than that. And I did put forward that idea. But again, we'll see what facts emerge now uh, in the coming uh, weeks and months. I also suggested that this case might be connected to heartbreak. I thought the heartbreak might be in relation to Jessica Thompson, 
but time will tell if they had a connection, etc. Uh, but Professor Abbott thinks it could potentially be in relation to his ex-wife. But I still did put forward a theory that I thought that this was a heartbreak case. I also suggested that the code in the Ruby ad was most likely not related to espionage. And again, this was in the face of a huge amount of content uh, saying, you know, with absolute certainty that this was a spy code and even uh, code crackers have attempted to decipher it with no success. I always felt that it was something sort of idiosyncratic, something personal to the summoner man that he understood. He understood this code. It could have been a prompt, something to remind him of something. Interestingly, in the last day or two, Professor Abbott has been saying that apparently he liked to gamble. So he liked to back a horse. Maybe this was some kind of uh, code for, you know, uh, horses that he wanted to back. I also suggested that the name Tikin was not an alias. And again, this was in the face of a tsunami of material that suggested it was a cover for him being a spy. I always felt it was a real person's name. I just thought that it was the Summoner Man's name. However, it's emerged that it is, in fact, his brother-in-law's name. I did suggest that... Uh, the forename T could possibly be Tom because the Keen is a very prevalent Irish surname and Tom is a popular forename and it has turned out actually that his brother-in-law is called Thomas Keen. Maybe Thomas Keen has some Irish ancestors or was Irish himself and again the facts will emerge in the fullness of time. I also suggested that the tags on the Summoner Man's clothing were not removed because he was a spy. I thought maybe because they were uncomfortable or he was disguising the cost of the clothing. Maybe because clothing was found in his suitcase with the name of his brother-in-law on it, T. King. It was obvious he had borrowed clothing. Um, could he have removed the tags because he didn't want to show that the suit also uh, belonged to T. King? I also suggest in the Summon a Man video that he was not in a marital relationship and this has proved to be correct. He was in fact separated. Just something about his behaviorisms suggested this to me and, and that has turned out to be correct. And finally, I did put forward a theory that the Summon a Man was an electrician possibly uh, in a trade that he had been in the Merchant Navy potentially for a while and was now in a trade um, was living settled in Australia. I thought that he was possibly from overseas, but I did actually specifically say electrician. And it has turned out that uh, Carl Webb was in fact an electrical engineer and instrument maker. And now we know for certain, according to Professor Derek Abbott, that he was not a professional ballet dancer at any rate um, because he was an electrical engineer. And uh, I did also put forward that theory that I thought he wasn't a ballet dancer. I felt he would have been recognised, uh, you know, if he had been a, a ballet dancer. So what did dark vanishings get wrong about the Summerlin man? Um, and again, facts may mutate in the coming weeks and months, you know, as the pieces are, are, are put together. But at this juncture, uh, I, I just like to see how I, I line up with uh, some of the facts that have emerged in the last few days. So the first mistake that I made was that the Summoner Man was not Irish. He was born in Victoria in Melbourne. The surname Keane was found on clothing in the Summoner Man's suitcase. It's a very prevalent surname in Ireland. So I thought that the Summoner Man was Irish. It turns out that T. Keane, as I mentioned, was his brother-in-law. It is a bit mysterious, uh, the fact that the Summoner Man had to borrow clothing from his brother-in-law. Um, uh, and, and of course, I didn't expect that. So I thought that the surname King belonged to the Summoner Man. Uh, I could never have anticipated that he had borrowed clothing from a relative. It just it didn't even occur to me. Um, and I did ask myself, why did he borrow clothing from his brother in law? Uh, he was an electrical engineer. Surely he must have been doing fairly OK. It, it's all just a little bit uh, mysterious. Um, I did wonder maybe he borrowed it for an interview. Maybe it might explain why he was in the area uh, at least one other time that we're aware of. Perhaps he planned to move there. Uh, had he fallen on hard times? Did he have a gambling issue and uh, didn't have much money and needed to borrow some clothing? It's all very mysterious, but I guess the facts will emerge in the coming weeks and months. The next thing that I got wrong was that the son of a man was not the father of Jessica Thompson's son. This has actually been uh, proven through DNA analysis. Uh, this one has completely thrown 
uh, even Colleen Fitzpatrick, the genealogist, uh, she said in an interview yesterday, there are so many weird things about this case because Jessica Thompson's son looks so like the son of a man and they share a very unusual or uncommon, if you like, condition, um, which is, um, you know, they had a very unusual ear physiology, both of them, and they both had orthodontia. And the odds of having that, if you're not related, are very high. So it's uh, one of those uh, mysterious things uh, that can arise I guess that's life where you know on paper all the science matches up but in reality uh, this you know isn't the case the nature of the summon a man's relationship with Jessica Thompson is also still unclear so in my summon a man video I did look on ancestry.co.uk at the surname Keen. It's described as an Irish surname, and I was curious to see about Webb, and it's described as an English surname. Perhaps Carl Webb had uh, ancestors, um, you know, who were English. Uh, it's it's very possible, very probable. It's funny because the coroner actually did describe him as being European in appearance, which was interesting. So perhaps he had a parent, quite a close relative, who was English. So that will be interesting to see as well. And I'm sure these facts will emerge, uh, uh, you know, in the coming weeks and, and months. According to Professor Abbott, Webb was born in 1905 in a suburb of Melbourne. He was the youngest of six children and married Dorothy Robertson, known as Duff Webb. Professor Abbott says, quote, we have evidence that he had separated from his wife and that she had moved to South Australia, so possibly he had come to track her down. Um, what is extraordinary is when I, I read that he had six siblings, I think, gosh, his you know picture was in newspapers all across Australia. How did, you know, uh, not even one member of his very large family uh, recognize him. Perhaps people look quite different after they've passed. Then I wondered, was he a bit of a black sheep? Uh, had they maybe, uh, you know, lost contact with him over the years? Perhaps they wanted nothing to do with him. Uh, had he done something bad? Did he have a criminal record? Um, had he ever spent time in jail? Uh, all these sort of questions came to mind. Having said all that, um, you know, the fact that, uh, as I mentioned, you know, his brother-in-law was clearly very helpful to him. This would suggest that he was on reasonably good terms with at least one member of his family. So it's it's all really, really mysterious. I did wonder, could he have had mental health issues? Uh, you know, perhaps he had, uh, you know, psychological issues. They could have been quite serious. Perhaps that was also an issue. So I guess we will find out in the uh, fullness of time. I'm really delighted for Professor Derek Abbott, who has worked on this case for a decade, uh, and also for Colleen Fitzpatrick. Uh, this is a stunning piece of detective work. It really is. I mean, this was the coldest of cold cases, and to solve it after 73 years is really extraordinary. And finally, I'm really happy for the Somerton man who died this sad and lonely death on a beach in South Australia. Finally, his identity has been restored to him. And we now know that he was Carl Webb. Thank you for watching. I really appreciate it. Please do like, comment or subscribe if you like the video. Every like, every comment, every new subscriber really means a lot to me. Uh, I look forward to seeing you in the next episode of Dark Vanishings and do take care and all the best.